What's up everyone? My name is Void and welcome back to my channel. Uh, today I'm going to be covering the crash of AF447. So Air France 447. Let me change my title really quick. I'm good at this. Uh, okay, so we got crash of Air France 447. Um... So this one's kind of interesting because this isn't like a mysterious disappearance or anything. This is a crash because of automation. So this one's going to be a little bit different. This one's more technology based and like we know what happened. Caramel macchiato. I figured out that I can drink coffee. It just has to be ungodly amounts of sweet. Okay, cool. Anyway, uh, without further ado, let's get into it. So I did kind of skim through the first part. This is just kind of like incident report almost. So I'm going to start with automation on the flight deck. So commercial aircraft fly on autopilot for much of the time. For most pilots, automation usually ensures that operations stay well within safe, predictable limits. That makes sense. I can, I can see why that does that. Um, pilots spend much of their time managing and monitoring rather than actively flying their aircraft. Interesting. I mean, that doesn't surprise me. Um, actually, you know what? Managing and monitoring that reminds- monitoring, sorry. That reminds me of uh, a story that one of my professors was telling us. So we were talking about- oh no, I don't remember what kind of plane it was. Uh, it was some kind of plane and basically they needed three computers to be decision making and they all had to make the same decision. Like, so basically it was kind of like a democracy of three computers and they would all vote on things and they had to vote the same way. And if one of them differed, then that one would get like removed from the voting process and it would like no longer be part of it. And then there would only be two left. And then if one of them differed, one of them would be kicked off. Um, so, but here's the thing, in that plane, you had those three computers. If one of them got kicked off, what they said was, you you stop, you land immediately, regardless of what you're doing. And then if the second one gets kicked off, eject. Just straight up eject. Gone. Go. Bye. I thought it was crazy that they actually had something where it's like, if two computers get knocked out, just eject. Get the hell out of that plane. That's crazy. Uh, that's just kind of what like this reminded me of, like managing and monitoring, because you'd have to be like monitoring that stuff. Okay, let's continue. Um, all right. Cockpit automation, sometimes called the glass cockpit, compromises an ensemble of technologies that perform multiple functions. Cool. I am probably going to have to pause after each sentence because my brain reading is a little difficult. Um, they gather information, process it, integrate it, and present it to pilots often in simplified, stylized, and intuitive ways. Through the fly-by-wire, in which pilot actions serve as inputs to a flight control system that, turn, that in turn determines the movements of the aircraft's control surfaces, technology meditates the relationship between pilot action and aircraft response. That was a lot of information. Hold on. Okay, fly-by-wire, flight control system, determines aircraft movements and control surfaces. Okay, okay. Cool. I just had to reread that because that was so much my brain did not process any of it. Um, let's see. So fly-by-wire. Basically, okay, so it's determining the movements of the aircraft's control surface and, like, all of the things that it needs to do. So this reduces the risk of human errors due to overload, fatigue, and fallibility. I'm amazed that I just read that, uh, and prevents maneuvers that might stress the airframe and endanger the aircraft. Okay, so what I'm hearing from all of this stuff is like, it is pretty well used, and it does um, reduce human errors of like these things, which are all... Um, because I'm an AET major right now, I have a class where we're talking about like electrical work. So in my electrical class, we have what's called the dirty dozen. Basically, it's sorry, let me I'm adjusting my headphones. Uh, basically, it's things that like cause human error. So like distraction, fatigue, um, things like that. So th those are two of the dirty dozen. And this is kind of reminding me of that. Um, 
Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just looked at my phone. Someone's calling me. Um, so yeah, this seems like it actually does help a lot. Okay, let's see what the next paragraph has to say. All right. Automation provides massive data processing capability capacity and consistency of response. However, it can also interfere with pilots' basic cycle of planning, doing, checking, and acting, which is fundamental to control and learning. Interesting. Also, if that person calls me again, I will have to end my stream, so <laughs> five minutes in, let's go. Um, if it results in less active monitoring and hands-on engagement, pilots' situational awareness and capacity to improve when faced with excuse me when faced with unexpected unfamiliar events may decrease so basically by having this automation and like less engagement with it pilots aren't going to do as well if like something fails and they have to fix it manually is what i'm hearing from this so this erosion may lie hidden until human intervention is required that's, yep, okay, so I was right on the money with that one. For example, when technology malfunctions or encounters conditions, it doesn't recognize and can't process. Yeah, because, like, when you're dealing with the real world, you have things that, like, they don't happen very often, or maybe it's something that hasn't happened at all because it's, like, technology-based, and so, like, you didn't know that this thing could go wrong until you implemented this new technology where it can go wrong, and suddenly, oh no, nothing works. Oh god, what do we do? So yeah, I can I can see why that would be potentially problematic should things go wrong. In a perfect world, nothing would go wrong, but we're not in a perfect world, are we? Um, so imagine having to do some moderately complex arithmetic. Most of us could do this in our heads if we had to, but because we typically rely on technology like calculators and spreadsheets to do this, it might take us a while to call up the relevant mental process to do it on our own. Well, it depends. I had to do an entire calculus class, like, without a calculator. So, depends on what you mean moderately complex arithmetic. Because uh, calculus does involve a lot of arithmetic. Uh, what if you were asked without warning to do this under stressful and time critical conditions? The risk of error would be considerable. Well, the risk of error is always considerable, uh, especially with like the different kinds of brains that people have. I mean, adding stress and time constraints definitely makes it worse. That actually reminds me of something. I think it's very interesting that it does. I mean, like, obviously it would add under stressful and time critical conditions because, you know, when you're flying a plane, you only have X amount of time until you crash. Like, that is true. And that is, like, a pretty stressful thing to look at. Um, yeah, panic does not help in stressful situations. But I do think it's interesting that they add stressful and time critical because in my experience, uh, I have ADHD, so a processing speed, like I have a little bit slower processing speed than some of my neurotypical peers. Um, one thing I've noticed is that when it does come to per particularly stressful conditions, or things that would get people panicking, as long as it's not like oh, solve 872 times 736 divided by 6,327. As long as I don't really have to do that under a stressful and time critical condition or something along like that, where it's like, okay, in this time frame, you have to like get to this place, do this thing, complete this certain task. I've noticed that I'm much better at doing that than some of my peers because I, I don't actually know why, but I've kind of noticed that like difference between people with ADHD and my friends who are uh, neurotypical or like honestly just difference between neurodivergent and neurotypical like that's something I've just noticed in my experience like I'm better at stressful physical problem solving than some of my neurotypical peers. I just I don't know I just thought that was interesting. Assuming I know what I'm doing, if it's like fix an engine in X amount of time and I know what I'm doing, I'm going to do it faster than some of my peers, which is weird because I have a processing disorder. Anyway, um, that was a little bit of a tangent. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> this was a challenge that the crew of AF447 faced, but they also had to deal with a certain auto, sorry, automation with certain automation surprises, such as technology behaving in ways that they did not understand or expect. That's a problem on the engineer's side. 
personal opinion, the engineers should have briefed them on, like, everything that can possibly go wrong. Because, like, you have to do those things at the beginning of flights where it's like, if the plane crashes in water, here's where you can find the life jackets, and here's, like, things in the aisle. Well, like, I've been on a plane enough times that I could probably recite all of it from memory. Um, or, like, you can use your seat cushions as a flotation device. Children under, like, X amount of pounds have to get it from this specific place in order to have a life vest that actually, like, works for them and isn't way too heckin' big. Um... And, like, if the pressure drops in the cabin, the masks will come down from above. Make sure to help yourself before helping other people. That kind of thing. They always have to do that, no matter how unlikely it is. So the engineers definitely should have said something like, Hey, this could possibly go wrong, and if everything goes to shit, like, if everything just out the window, it's like Satan popped up in front of the plane and whatever, Here, here's how you just completely shut off the system. And, like, it's all manual from that point. Like, they probably should have been told how to just be like, get rid of the system. This is how you get rid of the system entirely. Like, it no longer affects the plane. That should always, there should always be a big red off button, is what I'm getting at. Uh, so AF-447 was three and a half hours into a night flight over the Atlantic. Oh, no. Transient icing of the speed sensors on the Airbus A330 caused inconsistent airspeed readings, which in turn led the flight computer to disconnect the autopilot and withdraw flight... Eh, hold on. Disconnect the autopilot and withdraw flight envelope protection, as it was programmed to do when faced with unreliable data. The startled pilots now had to fly the plane manually. Okay, so it shut itself off. That's an interest. Okay. Okay. Uh, a string of messages appeared on a screen in front of the pilots giving crucial information on the status of the aircraft. All that was required for one pilot, Pierre Cedric Bonin, I'm trying, to maintain... That sounds very French. This sounds very French. Um, I was a French student for three years. Pierre is very French. Uh, to maintain the flight path manually while the other, David Robert, diagnosed the problem. But Bonin's attempt to stabilize the aircraft had precisely the opposite effect. Oh no! This was probably due to a combination of being startled and inexperienced at manually flying at altitude. How could you possibly be inexperienced at manually flying at altitude? Is that not part of the training that they have to go through? Because I feel like if it's not, it absolutely should be. I'm going to ask my pro flight friend about that later. You know what? On one of these, I might I might read through this again, and I might get one of my pro flight, fl <laughs> pro flight friends to like read some parts of this and be like, Okay, did y'all learn about this or not? Nah? Like... What's going on here? What do you? What are your thoughts on this? That would, that would be interesting. Um, okay. Uh, so this is probably due to a combination of being startled and inexperienced at manually flying at altitude and having reduced automatic protection. This is why I don't drive with um, cruise control on. <laughs> I know that's completely different, but this is why I don't drive with cruise control on. Like, I don't want to get too comfortable. Um, at higher altitudes, the safest flight, or the safe flight envelope is much more restricted than at lower altitudes, which is why pilots rarely hand fly there. Okay. Okay, so that makes sense. At least they're kind of, like, explaining things. Um, he attempted to correct a slight roll that had occurred as the autopilot disconnected, but overcorrected. That's how they get you. That's how they get you. That happens in cars, too. Um, causing the plane to roll sharply left and right several times. I want to know what was going through the passenger's head. Like, the passenger's heads. Sorry, there was more than one person. Because, like, imagine just, like, your plane, your plane just, like, knocking you around and stuff like that. And I guarantee somebody was, some poor bastard was in the bathroom. Somebody was in the bathroom. <laughs> Um, as he moved the stick, or as he moved his side stick from side to side. He also pulled back on the stick, causing the plane to climb steeply until it stalled, oh, and began to rapid descend rapidly, almost in free fall. <sighs> yup. 
he put the... Actually, it's really interesting that now I know what stalling means because... So basically what happened is because the plane was climbing steeply, he put the angle of attack too high. So basically the wings were pointing too high upwards, and so the air was no longer flying... Like, the air was no longer gliding smoothly over the wings, and it was getting all turbulent. And now it's no longer creating lift. That's what it means when it stalls. It is no longer creating lift. Like, it's the air is not doing what it's supposed to to keep the plane in the air. That is extremely problematic. That is what causes a lot of plane crashes. Um, neither Bonin nor Robert, nor the third crew member, Marc Dubois, the captain, who entered the cockpit 90 seconds into the episode, recognized that the aircraft had stalled despite multiple cues. Oh, dear God. How do you not recognize that it stalled? It's... What? That's just incompetence. At that point, that's just incompetence. Um, in the confusion, Bonin misinterpreted the situation as meaning the plane was flying too fast and actually reduced the thrust and moved to apply the speed brakes. No! No! No, 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 no. What you need to do when it stalls is even it the hell back out! Even it back out! What the, what the, mm. Oh no. Oh no. Yeah, the opposite of what was required to recover from the stall. Yeah. Robert overruled him in an attempt to take control, but Bonin continued to try and fly the plane. Why? Why? All of these sound like men's names, so I am going to assume that they are all men. Um, what is it with men and just not listening to other people? Because there are some situations where it's like, I do realize this is a societal thing, where like society tells men, like, hey, you have to be in control at all times. And like, you're the one who fixes the problems, right? Like, don't let anyone tell us to take that away from you or else you're like a beta or whatever. Um, you don't do that. Don't If you don't know what you're doing, step down. That is, this is making me very angry. <laughs> That's what's happening here. This is making me very angry. Um, yeah, no, if someone knows more than you, if someone thinks you are doing the wrong thing, especially in an emergency situation, try everything. Because something is bound to work, but if you do not know what you're doing, because it literally said, like, he probably had no idea what he was doing. If you don't know what you're doing and someone else is more experienced, step the step down. Step down. Let someone else take control of that. Because... Your ego is not important in that situation. In a life or death situation, your ego is not that important. Um, okay. <laughs> this is, oof, this is making me a little angry. Okay. Um, where are we at? Where are we at? Uh, try and fly the plane. He and Robert made simultaneous and contradictory inputs without realizing that they were doing so. Oh, dear God. Communication. Also, that reminds me. Communication is so important communication. I need to text back my friend really quick because they don't know where I am and I am going to tell them. Real, real quick. Real, real quick. I promise. Give me two seconds. I'm sorry. In my dorm. Okay, back to the story at hand. Here we go. Sorry, my friend just didn't know where I was and they called twice and then they texted me and I was like, oh no, they're gonna get concerned. Um, by the time the crew worked out what was going on, there was insufficient altitude left to recover. Oh. The AF-447 crashed into the ocean with the loss of all 228 passengers and crew. Jesus Christ. That's deeply upsetting. Because that really should not have happened. That really had, like, no reason to happen. Like, the computer was fine. It was... To be completely fair, it was, like, entirely, pretty much... Looking at the situation from the information that I have here, looks like it's entirely this guy's fault. He... he messed up. This guy messed up. Not to speak ill of the dead or anything, because I know that's generally frowned upon. But this guy messed up. Like, he... He should not have continued trying to fly the plane. He clearly did not know what was going on. Like, you know what? After, uh, where does it say it? Where does it say it? Um, after, like, this whole thing, 
after like causing the plane to roll and then steeply causing like causing the plane to climb steeply and stalling it like he should have known if you climb too steeply if you make the angle of attack too high the plane is going to stall like the airflow is not going to do what it's supposed to do at a certain angle of attack and it's really not that high of an angle of attack he probably should have known better, and, like, after this little mishap that happened up here, he probably should have, like, let go and been like, okay, y'all know more than me, the captain is in here, like, literally the captain. Should have, should have let one of them fix it. Because he clearly did not know what he was doing. 228 passengers and crew. That's... That is deeply upsetting. Okay, uh, the AF-447 tragedy starkly reveals that interplay between sophisticated tech and its human counterparts. Yeah. This begins with the abrupt and unexpected handover of control to the pilots, one of whom, unus unused to, flying to hand flying at altitude, made a challenging situation much worse. Like I said, he should have given it to one of the other pilots or the captain, or someone else, because he, just based on what he did, like the fact that he made the plane list from side to side, and he stalled the plane, he should have given over control to someone else. And the thing is, is like the other guy, what, what was his name? What, what was his name? David Robert? Should have, should have given it to Robert. Should have let like Robert or Dubois handle the situation. Because he, he didn't know what he was doing. This is, I would also like to point out, like, this is just my take on the situation, like, based on the information presented. I'm sure there were a lot more things that were happening in the moment that, like, no one knows because none of us were there. And I'm sure there's, like, a lot more things that, like, forensic engineers who were looking at it know. I'm, I'm sure there's so much more to this. But just, like, based on the information I have... My conclusion is, Pierre should not have continued flying after doing the thing. Like, the other two probably, I mean, the other two probably did know, like, oh god, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. Because, <laughs> yeah, it literally says that, like, Roberts tried to take the controls, like, from him. Um, also, another thing I'm getting at from this is more simulation training do this in a simulation where no one can get hurt. They probably do. That's probably definitely been implemented since this happened. Simulation training. I would also like to do simulation training anyway. Uh, I am texting my friend again. Sorry! No done in a bit. There we go. Okay, cool. Um, sorry, I'm like trying to do 12 things at once. I'm doing great. Okay, so, uh, t -t 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 yep. Okay, challenging situation, much worse. A simulation exercise after the accident demonstrated that with no pilot inputs, the AF-447 would have remained at its cruise altitude following the autopilot disconnection. Oh, that makes it even worse. That Oh, that makes it infinitely worse. Oh, no. If they would have just hands off laissez-faire, if they wouldn't have touched it. Oh. That. That is. Mm, that hurts. That, that hurts. This. This hurts. This. This. Wow. Mm. That one, that that gets me. That gets me. All right. Uh, with the onset of the stall, there were many cues about what was happening available to the pilots, but they were unable to assemble these cues into a valid interpretation, perhaps because they believed that a stall was impossible. Again, they probably should have been briefed on that. Probably should have been briefed like, hey, if it turns off, it can stall. I feel like someone should have said that, or like they should have known that, or something should have been there where it's like, since fly-by-wire technology normally prevents pilots from causing a stall, 
<clears throat> There's just so much here. There's so much here. Did I just face palm? Yeah, I did a little bit. I did a little bit. Um, or perhaps because the technology usually did most of the assembling of cues on their behalf. This kind of reminds me of the whole car thing, where it's like, if you learn to drive a stick shift, you can drive an automatic. If you learn to drive an automatic, you're probably never going to learn to use a stick shift, and or it's going to be a lot harder. Mm. Sorry, I'm just sipping my caramel macchiato. Um... <laughs> Very no bueno for this situation, but that's okay. <laughs> um, the possibility that an aircraft could be in a stall without the crew realizing it is also apparently beyond what the aircraft system designers imagined. But as a designer, shouldn't you have something where it's like, okay, if the plane stalls, we're gonna have a big alert in like big red letters saying it, it heck installed. You stalled the plane. Lower the AOA. <laughs> uh, features designed to help the pilots under normal circumstances now added to their problems. Yep. Yep, that's usually how it goes. For example, to avoid the distraction of false alarms, the stall warning was designed to shut off when the forward airspeed fell below certain speed. Which it did as AF-447 made its rapid descent. However, when the pilots twice made the correct recovery actions, putting the nose down, the forward airspeed increased, causing the stall alarm to reactivate. So how did they not realize that the stall was happening? Because they had the stall alarm. They did. At certain points, they did. All of this contributed to the pilots' difficulty in grasping the nature of their plight. Seconds before impact, Bonin can be heard saying, this can't be true. That's... Oh. This is, like, really... This is deeply upsetting. I think, I think I'm gonna stop here because, like, we do have, like, the implications for organizations, and if you do want to, like, read all of this, like, including the parts that I did not cover uh, on my own, it's this, Harvard Business Review, a uh, tragic crash of the flight air, AF-74, or, oh my god, AF-447 shows the unlikely but catastrophic consequences of automation by Nick Oliver, Thomas Calvert, and Christina, I can't read that. So this, this is what it is, if you want to read it for yourself, um, Harvard Business Review, it's on that website. If you want to read the whole thing, that's what it is. Um, but yeah, this is... There's, there's a lot of information here, and especially, like, just in the events that led to this crash happening. It's this. It's really just this. Like, because of that, because of knowing that, it's like there's no reason that this should have happened. And that's, like, a really hard thing to kind of realize because one thing one thing I always do when I think about plane crashes um be careful while listening to this because this is also a very dark topic I probably should have had a trigger warning um but uh the thing about this sentence right here means it really shouldn't have happened and also they should do more simulation exercises however many they do do more <laughs> do more <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, goodness gracious, and one thing I always think about whenever I hear about, like, plane crash stories is that the, the pilots are more aware of what's going on with the plane. I mean, according to this, that doesn't mean they actually know what's going on, but, like, they're more aware. What was going on in the heads of the passengers? Like, the plane just starts rocking back and forth, and then it goes up too high, and then suddenly it's almost in a free fall. Because it said, like, he brought it up too high, so it was almost in a free fall. Like. Yeah, almost in free fall, right there. What, what was everyone in the passenger part of the airplane? 
What were they thinking? What was going through their heads when all this was happening? And there were there were probably kids on board. Like they don't they don't say that, but there there were probably kids on board. That's this is all very deeply upsetting. Yeah, I prefer to this is usually why I don't get into like the actual crashes where it's like we know exactly what happened because then it's like this shouldn't have happened. This this was like entirely human error. This is quite literally entirely human error. This was not the fault of the technology really. It was the fault of like the pilots being unprepared for this kind of situation. Hmm. Yeah. This is why I usually stick to the, um, like, oh, mysterious disappearance. Because then it's like, okay, yeah, the people, like, like Flight 19, for example, like, the people, yeah, they, they, they probably died. But there's always the possibility, like, oh, who knows? Maybe they stumbled upon Atlantis. Maybe they were abducted by aliens. Maybe they washed up on the shore of, like, a nearby country or something. Maybe. Like, there's, there's always that possibility of, well, we don't actually know. So they could be totally fine. A little traumatized, but totally fine. That's, yeah, that's it. <laughs> this, this is a lot harder, because it's like, these people did die. There is no question about that, and there is no question that it was the, it was the pilot's fault. Like, actually, you know what? I want to hear what everyone else has to say about this. So... If you think I'm right, like it was the pilot's fault, tell me about it. If you think I'm wrong, if you think I'm wrong about any part of this, or like anything that I say, if I, if you think I'm wrong, tell me in the comments. I'd love to know. I like engaging with people and talking about things, because starting a conversation is the only way to learn. So um, definitely, definitely talk to me about this kind of stuff. Um, I am going to end the video here before it gets too, too long. So let me put this on here, just for that. Um, so <laughs> this intro feels so out of place with that like really heavy topic that I just got into. Um, either way, thank you so much for watching this whole time. I hope my commentary was interesting. And again, if you want to read it, this is the, this is the site. This is what it is. Google that and you can find like everything, even the things that I didn't cover. Um, if you like this content, hit the like, hit that subscribe, hit that follow, depending on what you're on, it means a lot to me, really helps me out, really tells me that, like, I'm going in the right direction with content, people want to see this. Um, other than that, you know what, have a great day. Have Go out, have a good day, get outside, breathe some fresh air. Uh, it's really cold for me right now, but get outside, get outside, make sure to eat food, do all that good stuff. Um... And I hope to see you in my next video. Void, signing out.